All right, so what we're looking at here is we've seen that we have a data book with something called a table of selected standard electrode potentials that tells us what things are good at oxidizing, what things are good at reducing. And what we're thinking about in this section is what if you didn't have the book? What if you were the first chemist and you, had, you were the one who had to build the book? How would you figure that sort of thing out? And so they have a series of tests here that you might perform if you were trying to understand electrochemistry. And what it involves is you take four metals, copper, zinc, lead, and silver, and you take solutions of their ions. There they are, same ones. And one by one, you put pairs of these in a bowl and see if anything happens. So for the moment, we're going to use the book to figure out what this experiment would do if you if you ran it. Um, so each of these represents a combination of a certain metal mixed in with a certain solution. Forgive me for a moment if I skip the ones with copper to copper. We'll come back and zinc to zinc, lead to lead, etc. We'll circle around to those in a bit. So let's start with something like this. Copper metal in zinc to zinc solution. So if you have copper metal and zinc and it's an aqueous solution, so there must be water. If you go to your data book and look down the list of oxidizing and reducing agents, going down the left side, I believe you'll find the strongest oxidizer is, I'm looking myself right now, so this is a genuine investigation, zinc 2 is the strongest oxidizer, and it's just barely ahead of water. It's one line above water. So zinc 2 ions are our SOA. And if you look up the right side for a reducing agent, lithium, potassium, barium, and so on, I have a pretty good idea what I think it's going to be. I'm just checking to make sure. Just above the center of the page, you find copper metal, which is our strongest reducing agent. Now, is that reaction spontaneous? I found zinc to like three quarters of the way down the page over here, so that's our strongest oxidizer. Copper metal is about middle of the page, maybe a tiny bit higher. So remember what it means if your oxidizer is below your reducer or the line connecting them goes uphill like this. It means no reaction. So I'm going to put no or you could put a dash for nothing happens or anything like that. If you put copper metal in the zinc solution, they just sit there and it looks like no chemistry takes place. All right. If you're looking at the number of cells in the table and cringing at how long this is going to take, after I've done a couple, I'll pick up speed and we should be able to knock this off rather fast. There are some patterns that we can exploit. So next combination would be copper metal lead ions and the ubiquitous water and looking down the left side copper metal is on the right side of the table so I don't even need to watch for that it's a question of is it lead 2 or is it water copper 2, tin 2, lead 2 is just below middle of the table and copper is above it again which means again no reaction And finally, instead of rewriting all this, I'll just switch out one metal for another. We have copper metal versus silver ions. Will it react with them? Going down your left side, the silver ion is, oh, is that a third of the way down? Something like that? 40% of the way down, it's about there. And going up the other side, we encounter copper ions, and critically, Copper is just a little lower than silver. That means the line connecting them goes downhill, and that means yes. We finally get a hit. There is a reaction there. Rx in chemistry is short for reaction. Okay, one last one. What happens if, I said we'd get to this, you have copper and copper too? put copper ions and copper metal. There's also water. 
Is there a reaction? Well, if you look down the left side, you'll find copper 2 is your strongest oxidizer. If you look up the right side, you'll find copper metal is your strongest reducer. They are in the same line, which means the line connecting them is flat. And if you think about the analogy of a rock rolling, where a rock will roll downhill by itself, but it won't roll uphill by itself, will a rock roll on totally flat ground? No, nothing nothing happens in this case. You don't get any net reaction. Another way you can think of this is, what if there was a reaction? What if a copper 2 meets a copper, and the copper 2 says, I'm going to defy the data table for a moment and steal two electrons from you because I'm, I'm an oxidizer. I'm going to overachieve today and actually oxidize you. What happens? If you move two electrons over here, the copper 2 gains two electrons, which would turn it into copper metal. The copper metal loses two electrons, which turns it into copper 2. You wouldn't even be able to tell if that happens. We had a copper 2 and a copper before. We have precisely the same thing afterwards. They've exchanged some electrons, but at the macroscopic level where we see chemi chemical reactions, you wouldn't be able to tell that anything had occurred here. You've got the exact same species before as after, so there is no net reaction. And so that's another reason that we can go up here in the copper to copper and just say no. Now, having said that, the same is true for zinc reacting with zinc ions. That won't really do anything. Lead with lead ions and silver with silver ions. So there's a bunch we get for free. All right. Let's see if we can pick up the speed on this a little bit. I'll show you some ways we can slightly shortcut this checking instead of doing them all in meticulous detail. What we have here is zinc metal versus copper, lead, and silver. Zinc metal, if you find it on your periodic table, is about a quarter of the way down here. Well, any of these ions which are above zinc are going to oxidize it, so you can quickly just read up or down the left side of the table looking for oxidizing agents and see which of these metals are higher up than zinc. Well, zinc's about a quarter of the way down, copper is about halfway up. So. Yes, we will get a reaction with copper ions. Are lead 2 ions higher than zinc? Yep, lead is about middle of the table. And silver is about 40% of the way down the table. Reaction there also. So all three of those other metals are higher up than zinc. How about lead? If you find lead metal on the oxidation side. It's just below half. But there is your lead. Which of these other metals are higher up than lead? Is copper? Yep, it's about an inch higher on my table, so we can say Rx for that. Copper will react with lead metal. Zinc ions? Uh, no, zinc is actually lower. And silver ions are the highest one of all, so reaction there also. But no go for zinc. I'll switch back to my blue and say no. And finally, if you have silver metal, silver is up here. Will copper react with that? Nope, copper is a little a little below silver, so no reaction there. Zinc is the lowest one of all. It's not even close to silver. No reaction. And lead 2 is lower than silver, so nothing there. Good. So, two ways you can interpret this. You can look at the metals, and you could make a ranking of them where you say silver refuses to react with anybody. Lead reacts with two other metals. Zinc reacts with three other metals. And copper reacts with one other metal. So 
if you wanted to make a really rough ranking list, you could say you could make a list that goes from reactive metals to non-reactive metals. And you could say, okay, zinc reacts with three things. That makes it the most reactive. Uh, who's next? Lead reacts with two things, so it's a little less reactive. Uh, copper reacts with only one thing, so it's getting it's more on the non-reactive side. And silver, which doesn't react with anything in our list, is the most non-reactive. That would be a perfectly reasonable way to rank these elements. Sadly, the way that I laid this out, it's the reverse of how our table looks. So uh, let's see if we can come up with a way to make something that looks more like our electrode potentials. Well, the obvious thing you could do is say, I could switch these and put non-reactive at the top. So. If we do metals from non-reactive, metals that don't do anything, to reactive ones at the bottom, that would be one way that you could get silver at the top, then copper, then lead, and then zinc. So if you think of the metals that way, here's a table that's starting to look a little bit like our table of standard electrode potentials. It's got these metals in the right order. Another way that you could do it is instead of looking at the metals, we could look at the ions. And we could say, what's the most reactive ion? Well, if you look at the columns here, silver, silver ion reacts with three of these metals, which makes it the champion as far as reactivity goes, Ag+. Plus. And down here at the bottom, we're going to have non-reactive. Who's the second most reactive? Silver is three out of four. Copper is two out of four. The copper two ion seems to be the next in line. Lead reacts with one thing. Zinc ion doesn't react at all with any of our test metals. So here again is a way that you could lay out the ions, and this is a lot like what our the left side of our redox table looks like. It's got highly reactive ions down to weakly reactive ions in order. This is the same thing you'd see if you scan down the left side of our list. It's just, in this case, we only have four substances, so we get a little tiny table instead of the great big one in the data book. Okay, so this is how that table got built. It was chemists one at a time going, what happens if I put silver metal in copper solution? What if I put it in zinc solution? And if you make a big list like that and keep track of what reacts and what doesn't do anything, that's how you can build up a, uh, a table of electrode potentials. Now, they ask a few other questions about this. Let's see if we can tackle those. Get that in there, and I'm going to have to collapse this. This is going to be a little squinty to read, but you should probably have the full-size version in front of you also, so let's just see if we can think our way through these. Okay, well, they start with, what generalization can be made about a metal and its own ion? In other words, the ones on the diagonal here. They don't react, or it's a mixture of they generally don't react, and even if they did, you wouldn't be able to tell. It's like, what if you and your identical twin switched clothes? Well, you might know that it happened, but no one else would be able to tell the difference. So effectively, there is no, no change when this occurs. List the metallic ions in order of their tendency to form metals from greatest to least. We did that. It went silver, copper, lead, zinc from high to low, exactly the way they look in the table. So silver is the champion. It reacted with all the other three. Copper reacted with two of them. Lead could only react with zinc. And zinc ions are lame. They didn't react with any of these things. 
Write equations for the reactions that convert metallic ions to metals, include the appropriate number of electrons. Every one of these is in the data book, so I'm not going to write them all out. But every one of them will look like once upon a time there was a silver ion, it acquired an electron, just one electron because its charge was plus one, that's all it wanted, and that converted it into silver metal. And you can do that for the other three if you like. They'll they'll all look the same except uh, all the others will have two electrons instead of just one. These reactions are called half reactions. What are these? These involve an ion picking up an electron and then its charge goes down. That means they are reductions. We call these reduction half reactions. If the reactions were shown indicating the conversion of metals to their ions, Uh, well, if we were converting metals to ions, that would mean our reactions would all be once upon a time there was a metal and it turned into an ion, which means it must have lost an electron. Well, in saying that, I said lost an electron. Leo says Ger means that is an oxidation. Oxidation. That's a totally reasonable way to do it, and there are data books where the reactions are listed as oxidations instead of reductions. And if you looked at one of those tables, at first you'd say, wait a minute, this table's upside down. I've got fluorine at the bottom and lithium at the top. You can work that way. But the data book that Alberta Ed gives out, they just chose to use reduction reactions with electrons on the left. Both ways are valid, but I hope you get used to this one if you do any tests from my school or in the province of Alberta, that's what you're going to see. The metal ion that reacted with the most metals is the strongest, well, that would be silver ion, which is high up on the left side. And if you know about your table, you know that the strongest oxidizing agent is the one on the left side. So anything that you find on the left side, anything that can pick up electrons like that, is an oxidizer. If it's high up, it's a really good oxidizer. If it's way down here at the bottom, like lithium ion, it is a very weak oxidizer. So the metal of the reactor with the most metals is the strongest. You can put OA or oxidizer. And the metal of the reactor with the most metal ions, that would be zinc metal. It reacted the most because it was way down on the right side, and that's where you find the strongest reducing agents. And then they get weaker and weaker as you work your way up. So the metal that reacts the most is the strongest reducer. So there are two approaches you can take if you want to be, if you want to get into a lot of chemical reactions. You can be really high on this side and be a good oxidizer where you take other people's electrons, or you can be way down in this corner and be a strong reducer, meaning you're always giving away your own electrons. If you're in this corner, bottom left, or the top right, it means you don't react very often. Whatever your role is, you're weak at it. And that means people will say that you don't react very much.